on to my brown bag session. This is my first brown bag session and as you may not know it's also my first presentation since I was a student. So if I suddenly end up with a rabbits and headlights look, you'll probably recognise that anyway from stand up first thing in the morning. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> thank you. <Cliff. laughs> So I might be a little bit nervous, but I am very excited to be able to talk to you about poker, one of my favourite subjects. So there's an awful lot of information with poker, and I really did struggle to find out what I was going to do for this session. So I've kept it quite basic, and if it goes well, then I might do another session. If it goes badly, then I'll definitely do another session, because it'll show I need the, um, the practice. So, what is poker? I'm pretty sure that everyone who's walked into this room has some idea of what poker is. Whether they've seen it on TV, in a film, maybe they've played poker, or maybe you've just heard me talk about it often. So because of that, I think I'm, I'm going to op open it up to the audience and get your ideas. First of all, I'd like a volunteer to be able to write for me, because my handwriting is appalling. Is there anyone not eating who would like to write? My handwriting is worse than yours. Is it? <laughs> You're eating, aren't you? Okay. Yeah, go on. <laughs> go on, you're going to write for us. Well, I'm in prime position, really. Aren't you I? are. And you're last in, which is room. normally the rule. <laughs> <laughs> so, just one word or two words of what you think poker is. Does anyone want to. Oh, yes, Sparky costume. Some sort yes. of card game. Card games, first thing on my <laughs> list as well. It's played with a standard 52 deck of cards, um, four suits, 13 ranks, no jokers. Lots of people like to introduce jokers into their home game, <laughs> but not in my home game, because it adds far too much probability variance to it. In my opinion, jokers should be used for just what they were designed for, and that's a spares when you lose one from the main deck. So, lots of rule variants. Sorry? Lots of different rule variants. Lots of different rule variants, there are indeed. And I'm going to go through some of those. It's all about gambling. Gambling. Although I don't technically see it as gambling it is. It is used as gambling and people do come along. And, you know, just like they would put so much money on red, they do the same with poker. There's loads of them. <laughs> Meets bluffing. Bluffing, excellent. And I think that's one of the first things that a lot of people um, think about when they think of poker. However, it actually, I think a lot of books I read say that bluffing should be kind of done very infrequently, and the rate at which you should bluff should be about one hand for every four hands that you play. That sounds like work. That's true. <laughs> it sounds like work. That sounds like a lot. <laughs> but you shouldn't be playing that many hands. It's with four hands you play. If you play more than four hands in ten, so really you should be looking at playing less than 40% of your hands. I think you need to define play. Because playing yeah. game just sounds like... I think you need to find lots of things. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go through that. Yeah, I think you're, you're right. Play just means get involved, put chips, commit chips to the pot voluntarily. Seems to be more controlled rather than just a chance game. Yeah. I think there's a bit of both. Yeah. Some hands are better than others, but the rules for them are horrendously, horrendously complex. <laughs> Sorry, All about odds. Odds, absolutely. It's one of the biggest things I play when we're talking about odds later. Just like with any form of the other thing that I didn't write down? Different scoring hands. It's sort of meant they're often the same as odds, actually. Yeah. Anyone else have any more to add? Yeah, it mostly happens around midnight. <laughs> <laughs> the old fashioned idea of poker was that it was, you know, played in a dark, smoky room. Times have changed. It really has changed no, in the poker world. It's the same with chess. And professional poker players these days in white circles are celebrities. And um, it's really changed from being this, you know, back street scene to being, you know, bright, shiny, glistening rooms. Involved tipping over the table and shooting your opponent <laughs> <laughs> in, a, in a saloon in the Wild West. Do you want me to write that? No. <laughs> I'm reminded that's the only thing that really this can discriminate all of this uh, with any other card game. What, shooting your opponent? Yeah. <laughs> 
Actually, there are a couple of others I can think of doing similar things. Come in. <laughs> <laughs> So just for your benefit, just <laughs> That's mine. <laughs> Is it? That can't Not anymore. I'm writing down a list of what people think poker is. So both of you are new to the room and late, so I think you should come <laughs> on. Uh, so social event. Social event, absolutely. Don't worry, the next slide is all my ideas and a lot of them are similar to be honest. Dave? What do you think poker is, in a word? Gambling game. Oh, no. Not those, try again. Uh, it's going to be unique, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, a waste of money. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, to some people who don't know how to play and are just throwing their money away. I follow that. It has to be at least <laughs> half of the people playing it. That's what we want. More than half of the more than half of the people playing it. More than half. To be a waste of money. No, just just one person. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you must understand the arts. And there are times when it doesn't look, and I've got a good example of that later, where it doesn't look like you should be calling. It looks like it's such a ridiculous chance. However, the, um, the odds that are being laid out, you must play. You know, if someone said to you, I'll give you 50 to 1 to bet on Man United winning on Saturday, I think we'd all take that bet. So, you have to know your opponent, as I was mentioning before, and um, you need to be able to find the fish. You need to be able to find the bad players, because that's where most of your chips are going to come from, and that's how you're going to win. Also, as talked about before, you need a clear head. I don't agree with drinking and playing back. So, as I've talked about, it takes a minute to learn the game, but a lifetime to master. And I'm only probably a year into properly learning, ten years into playing. I made it spin because it's important. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it does, as you'll see, it does take a minute, but there's so much to it that um, I don't even think I'll touch the surface with some of the interesting concepts today. So what I'm going to go through is the different types of poker. So it's really straightforward. They're probably grouped into, there are different poker games, and they probably go into three different groups. So we have draw poker. That's a game where all the cards are actually dealt to you face down, which makes it quite difficult to play, because you have no idea what the other person has, except for any little tell that they give off, any body language, or how they bet. Stood poker. Some of the cards are dealt to you face down. Some of them are face, dealt to you face up which gives you a better indication of what hand they might be playing, along with any tells or how they're betting. Then we come to community card poker, which is the most popular um, version at the moment, and it's Texas Hold'em, and it's Omaha, and they're the two main card games um, played today, and what I'm going to focus on later is Texas Hold'em. Community card is where you're dealt cards face down, and the rest of the cards are face up, but they're for everyone to play. Everyone makes their hand from either what's in the middle and what's in their two hidden, or maybe more in Omaha you get four, whatever your hidden cards are, or known as whole cards. So what you're dealt and a face down are called whole cards. So there are different limit types. There are different um, amounts you can bet. So um, with fixed limit, you are stuck to only being able to raise a certain amount. For example, in a 20 um, fixed limit, one person could bet 20, the next could only raise it up to 40, the next person, if they wanted to, could only raise it up to 60. Um, and that's 10 limit um, games tend to be more the draw side and the stud games. Um, and then pot limit, you can only bet the size of the pot. So in that example, if we had the first person bet 20, the second 20 and the third 20, we've now got 60 together, so the next person can raise up to 60. Um, pot limit is normally played with Omaha, and um, it's quite interesting. It's generally played at very, very high stakes at the moment. They move to no limit. No limit, in my opinion, is the best one. <coughs> all your chips are at stake all the time. At the first hand, you can just say, all in, and push all your chips into the middle. It just looks so fun. <laughs> <coughs> I need to leave home after this. <laughs> <laughs> so there are also different types of um, this cash versus tournament. Sell your home. Sell your home. So um, in a cash game, you walk up to a table, there could be a few empty seats, you can sit wherever you like, and you can buy in based on the minimum and maximum. You don't have to to buy the maximum, you know, and you can re-add to how, much, how many chips you've had um, along the way. And you can get up and you can walk away whenever you like and cash all your chips in. So, in 1970, Benny Binion, the owner of a famous um, casino in Vegas, decided to invite seven of the top poker players to his casino to play. This was the first World Series of Poker. He managed to get them all to play over a series of days, fixed time, in cash style. At the end of those few days, he asked the seven players to vote for who they thought was the best. After he counted them all up, and it was a seven-way tie, he told <laughs> them, you must vote again, but please do not vote for yourself. <laughs> they finally did 
crown um, a champion. However, they decided this was not going to be the best way to find out who the best poker player is. So here comes tournament. Tournament. So the second year of the World Series of Poker, everyone bought in $10,000. They were each given a stack of $10,000. And when they lost them all, they were out until the very last person was there with all the chips and they were crowned the winner. And that's the main two differences that we have, and cash is still played an awful lot, and tournament is played a lot, but there are subtle differences on how you must, must play. With cash, for instance, you can keep reloading if you want, or you can leave whenever you like. You can pick the table you play at. At tournament, you have a set table and a set place. You can't just get up and leave whenever you like, because otherwise you'll lose chips. As the blinds come round, and I know I haven't talked about blinds, but I'll speak up about those later, also, um, the amount you have to put in every round goes up and up. So you have to start taking more chances, otherwise you'll lose. So I've played tournament for a long time and always said I can't play cash. Even though they're the same game, they're so subtly different that I speak to cash players who can't play tournaments. They're just that subtly different, and we'll go through that a bit more later. So then we've got live versus online, which is the obvious difference. With live, you can pick up on tells. You can see any little body language that they have. Um, however, there are some good tells you can see online. If you're sat there and you're waiting for someone to act and they're waiting for their timer to go all the way down to the end, then they suddenly play. They're trying to make it look like they're being indecisive. They probably have a good hand. Just like if someone acts really quickly, they're trying to make it look like they're not indecisive and that they do have a strong hand, so therefore they're probably bluffing. The other difference is, is with live is a bit slower. Because you've got an actual dealer physically dealing out cards, um, it takes a longer time, and online it'll go so much faster. And also online you can play multiple tables. On top of that, there's new software out there which allows you to monitor what you're doing online, which makes it great. So there are different tournament types, as we as briefly spoke about before. So the World Series of Poker that um, I spoke about was um, freeze out. So once he was out, he was out. And then um, there's a re-entry. So you can so some casinos allow you once you're out to buy for a fixed amount and go back into the game. Then there's also rebuys, which are subtly different. You can rebuy at a certain point. You might still have some chips left. Then there's bounty tournaments, which are lots of fun. You normally buy in for a set amount. A portion of that goes to the main part. And the other portion of that is actually put on your head. So whenever anyone knocks you out, they get that money. <coughs> so hopefully you now understand what No Limit Texas Hold'em Freeze Out Tournament is. <laughs> <laughs> which was a long-winded way, but there are lots of subtleties and lots of differences amongst the games, and so this is what we're going to carry on. So, I'm going to show you now, after waffling for <coughs> ages, um, how to play. This is um, Holden Manager software that I've bought. It records every single hand that I play and gives me statistics. Those numbers you see around the edges are statistics that I picked up on those players. You can ignore them for now, I won't go into detail, but just so you're aware of what they are. So as you can see, just by Raven167, he has a D button. That is a dealer button. That is where the action starts from. Next to him, one place clockwise, is the small blind. Now the small blind has put in 10 chips, because that's in this instance what the small blind is. This is a tournament, so that will slowly go up. This particular tournament that I played in, they went up every 15 minutes. So, and next to him was the um, big blind. So the person who'd be first to make any kind of action is Osmeria 12, the next person clockwise from the big blind, and it's his turn. So he can decide to either fold his cards he could call that 20, he, in order to play he has to at least call that 20, or he can raise, and he can raise the minimum of the big blind. So let's go through and see what he actually does. He actually raises to 40. The next player now must call the 40, he could raise it again, or he could fold. And again, and again, this actually comes around to me, that's my hand that you can see, and as you might guess, I fold. Especially as in this case, um, 
The person who's raised has actually raised before anyone else has acted. This is well known within poker that anyone who's first whacked, or under the gun as we call it, has a strong hand. You must have a strong hand to be able to raise from that position. This was also the very first hand of the tournament, so none of us had any idea if he was actually a good player and playing with a good hand, or if he was a bad player. So as you can see so far, we've all played it quite cautiously, and we've got fold, we have a fold. The small blind, who now only has to call 30 in order to play, also decides to fold. And the big blind, who's in for 20, only has to put in 20. Now those of you who play home games will be shocked to see he folds. <laughs> and, um, and that's, to most people, and probably to you at the moment, that's quite a dull hand. He's only won 30 chips. However, that's given me an awful lot of information. I know that most people will happily sit and wait round. We're playing in quite a big tournament. As you can see, compared to the chip stacks, we've got 7,500 chips. We can wait around. And it shows that a lot of people can be patient and won't... Um, try and contest that 40. So that's this very simplest hand you can possibly have. And uh, he won the 30 chips. Did that make sense? Have you got any questions? So this is a tournament you played in? Yeah. How did you record the moves as they were being played out? This is software that I bought and the software records it. You point it at right folders, the actual, so this would have been on full tilt. So full tilt actually writes out all its hand histories, everything you play to a file. Oh, okay. um, and every site does this, and then Holden Manager 2 looks Imports at that file it. and imports oh. it. And so I've got every hand I've played in the last year, oh. which is quite cool. This is the actual software behind. So this is the very next hand after this one. And as you can see, the D button, the dealer button, has moved one position clockwise, and it will move one position clockwise after every hand. And again, we have a small blind who's put in for 10, and a big blind who's put in for 20. So we have um, the next guy, as we said before, he could either fold, he could call the 20, or he could raise. So he folds, the next guy has the same decision who folds. The next um, person decides to raise decides to raise up to 80. Now that's quite a big raise in poker terms because it's four times the big blinds. But as you can see, I'm next to act and ace-king is a very good starting hand. It's probably about the fifth, depending on who you talk to, it's probably about the fifth best starting hand you can have. It's very powerful because it has two of the highest cards. So, as you can probably guess, I'm either going to call or raise, but me being me, of course I raise. And um, <laughs> I've raised three times that. And, and generally, if you're going to do a re-raise, it is between two and a half and three times. If anyone raises less than that, it signals to me straight away that they're not a regular player. Why raise so much at that point? Um, because I don't want anyone else in and I'm thinking he might call. <coughs> And three times is, you know, it's natural, it's the kind of thing. Okay. I could raise... You're, you're setting a floor of what you can call by to Yeah, yeah. And it also means that he can only call me with certain hands. So the, that's effectively what the player before did as well, because there was 30 in the pot and they raised yeah. it up to 80. Yeah, but I'm actually... But that's what the guy who's put in 80 has done. Yeah. And I've re-raised him on top. He said he's got a strong hand. I've gone, I've got a stronger one. So... <laughs> So we'll see um, where that goes from there. Um, and I was going to say something else about re-raising. Oh yeah, I could have raised what the difference is between the person before him and after. I could have raised it just 60. I could have raised it to 140. Now I think raising it just to 140 is just an easy call. If I see anyone do that, I'm re-raising again because I don't think they're very good or they have a very strong hand. <coughs> Um, so the next guy has to call my 240 or raise again. So anyone can raise again, and like I was saying, it's no limit. Anyone can put all their chips in whenever they like. So well, what? Sorry, Karen. Cool. What, what does call mean? Call means um, to put in to match what the last person so um, bet. They would have to put 240 in. So call is 240. Right. Good question. It's and one of the things I got confused with early on. And then, at what point does it end? It two people haven't um, 
if two people haven't folded. We'll show you, I've got another example of those. Okay. I've got plenty of examples. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a whole year's worth. <laughs> 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 Sorry, what was that? Not today. Not until today. Yeah. Yeah. I, I picked out a random selection. One, uh, one quick question. Yeah. Where are the rest of the cards, the community cards, in this round? They've not been dealt yet. Not been dealt yet. They've so it's only, it's only, you're only playing off the, the first yeah. two cards. This is the very first uh, <coughs> right. round of betting. Because right. the previous one, nobody actually saw any cards. No, no, no cards. Yeah. And that happens quite a lot. You'd be surprised how often. <coughs> Especially early on, don't forget, this is just the second hand in a tournament that I started playing at 6pm. 6, 6 I then realised it was getting quite late when I was still in it at 12 o'clock on a Sunday evening and had to throw the game. The next day I discovered it was still playing until quarter past eight in the morning. <laughs> there were nine and a half thousand people playing. <coughs> I came 446. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, so, so you can call, so like uh, Mark asked the question, I always got confused, what's the difference between betting, checking, calling, it's all terminology and all jargon, so please ask if I um, say these again, or if I use any jargon, please ask, because I'm no doubt going to use far too much. Um, so again, he could call, I put in the 240, he chooses to fold, the guy on the button can do the same, and um, the small blind would have to call 230, or he could raise it again. He decides to fold, the, again he'd need to match up to 240, he folds, and the guy who originally raised folds, and I win, yay! <laughs> and I win a little pop, and I'm quite happy with that, ace-king really isn't, it could turn out to be a bad hand once the cards are dealt. <coughs> so, here's another one, you actually get to see some cards on this one. <laughs> So it's the very next hand again, so it's just the third hand in this very long running tournament. As you can see, the dealer button's moved one. We've got small blind of 10, big blind of 20. So I've got a reasonable hand. That's quite a good hand. Not the best. How long do you have to play your room? Lucky you're doing something. How long? You, it depends. Um, you also get, you also get um, a time bank. So for instance, I think it's probably about 15 seconds. There's a bit of chess on that. You've got 15 seconds and then you've got a reserve, so if you really need to think about something, you can just press your time back. And I think, depending on the site, I think in this game it was about two minutes. And after so long it gets topped up again. Some games only give you 20 seconds. Why don't you go over time? You just fold your hand. Right. Or if there's been no action before you, which I'll show in a minute, it might just check. But I'll show that in a minute. So, um, so same scenario, he could call to 20, he could raise or he could fold. It's an early position, so he'd have to have a very good, good hand, not knowing what anyone else has. So he folds, he folds, I raise. You'll notice this theme a lot, I like raising. Um, the next guy just calls, so he just matches my 60. We have a fold, a fold, a fold. Another guy calls. And someone else calls, so we've got four people. So because we've now all matched and we're all in for 60, if anyone else would have raised, we would have had to all match that. But what this means now is we get to see what we call a flop. It's the first three cards of the community board. Everyone makes their hand from this. And it's five cards. Five cards is your hand. So in this case, I have a pair of queens with an ace, a king, and a six. Obviously there's an ace there, and I'm pretty sure that someone's probably called with an ace, so I'm not too excited about my pair of queens. So, um, the first guy checks, the second so, guy... Is that the first time you've seen those cards? Yes. Yeah. 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 Right, okay. And that's what ev the first time everyone's seen the cards yeah. as well. So everyone sees them, <coughs> everyone makes their hand from those. And, and the flop wouldn't have been played until all four players had matched the... Absolutely. And it, and it went back to, so the final guy to call was, the you know, one that begins with K. Yeah. Um, but then it went back to Asmeria to... Ah, that, that's a really, really good point, John. Thanks for that. So if I go back, on the second round of betting, it always starts one to the left of the dealer button. Right. And that's why I always say, being 
been early to speak, you will be early to speak on every round. It means you get less information. You always want to be the last person to speak, as you can imagine, because you always want as much information as you can. A lot of the professionals say that they play two-thirds of their hands from the last three positions. That's the dealer button, the next one anti-clockwise where Raven is, which is called cut-off, and the next one before that we call the hijack. They're such important places that we give them all individual names, and that's, you know, you are in prime position. And there's also some statistics that you will win two-thirds of the time, more often from those, with similar hands. What does check mean? Check means that they've got no action. So on the second round, um, because nothing's happened, no one's put anything in, you can just say check, which means I'm taking no ac action, I'm not putting any chips into the pot. <coughs> it's a good question. Thank you. I keep on missing these things out. There are things that I talk about and do every day which is so natural, but I know it's alien language to normal people. So, <laughs> so like, so he checks, he takes no action. So if everyone was to check, the next card would be in effect, effect free. So um, as you can see, I don't like giving free cards away, so I wasn't going to check. I'd raised in the first round of betting before the flop. So it's quite common and it's quite well known that the first person who raised takes the lead on the next raise. And this is just called continuation bet. It's a bluff. Everyone knows about continuation bets, so they don't work as effectively as they used to. They used to bet, and most people used to fold thinking you had something. So I make a continuation bet, at least hoping to narrow the field, because it's always easier to play against less people. So we get calls, so I probably think he's got an ace. The next guy folds, he also calls, probably got an ace. I'm probably done with this hand now because I think by putting some chips in, I've been able to see they've said they've got something, they've got something playable. They think that they've got something that can win. So now we've all matched with 140, another card is dealt. And again, it works the same way. Um, the next person clockwise from um, the dealer button acts first and he checks and then I check because like I say I'm really scared someone does have that ace and I'm just throwing good money after that. However, he checks and that really does quite surprise me, especially being last to act, especially if he had the ace I would have thought he would have wanted to put some more chips into the pot if he had a good hand. So then we have the nine is dealt. So, so the kind of hands that people could have at the moment, they could have an ace. If they had an ace in their hand, it would mean they would have two aces, which is a pair. If they had ace nine, for example, in their hand, it would mean that their hand would be two aces, a nine, and a queen. We don't forget about the queen because it's five cards that make up your hand. Um, someone could have a pair of sixes already in their hand. When you have a pair in your hand, we call those pockets. And that would mean that they would have three of a kind. So they're the kind of hands we're looking at, we're not looking at any big hands here. So, um, and people have been a bit weak, I think maybe someone might have had King Jack. If someone would have had King Jack, they would have had Ace, King, Queen, Jack, and they would have just needed a 10 because it's five cards to make a straight. I'll cover that a bit more, I'm seeing confused faces, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, so the next person um, comes along, he checks. This is the very last round of betting, by the way. The next person who comes along, which is me, um, can't help but bet. So I take a stab at the part and I make it quite low, really. And he folds, and he folds, and I quite quietly win that part without having to show my hand. Does that make sense? I know there was an awful lot going on. I know when I've played myself, it's really hard to keep track of when do you check, when do you bet, when do you raise, what's the rounds? So are there any so questions? Quite, it's quite interesting because you have three three hands mm. and money has changed, taken place, but nobody has ever seen anybody else's cards. It happens often. It happens a lot more often than you think. Um, it depends on the level as well. If you're playing, um, say, a house game, you'll see a lot of people will just put chips in to get to the end. 
Um, this game was a $30 buy-in. I got into it free. I played another game to get into it. But because it's a bit more money at stake, first prize was $150,000. Um, no, it was $50,000. So there's a big stake at risk, so people play a lot more conservatively, they don't want to give away their chips. But you will see at home games quite often, you will often get down to the end where you show for the best hand. Are you memorising any of these cards that go down? Don't need to, because it's dealt, after every hand it's shuffled. Um. It's full shuffle after every hand, so you don't need to remember anything. With stud poker, you might want to remember what other people have, because as soon as they fold, their face-up cards are turned face down. But in normal Texas Hold'em, you don't need to remember anything that's gone before. You just need to remember what, you're, what the other players are doing. That's what's quite interesting. So I think this one, we actually get down to the end. Oh, this one's really interesting. I would say that. <laughs> Did you win? <laughs> no, no, I don't win this. I actually, I actually fold. I run quite luckily, but this one's really interesting. This is so much of a geek I am. So um, the reason you can see these two hands here from the other players is because we saw them at Showdown. This is just software to review hands after the hand. <coughs> at the moment, you can't see. So this is a few hands later after the, um, the other one. And you can see again, the dealer button's moved to me. I'm in the best possible position because I see what everyone else does before I have to act. So the guy in first position raises to 70. Not surprising, now we know his hand is the best starting hand you can have in poker. You are likely to win with that hand against any other random hand, excuse me, 90% of the time if you are against one player. What's interesting to a lot of new players, they think, wow, I've got a great hand. It's ace-ace. I'm just going to call because I just want everyone else to play as well to get all the chips. Ace-ace against five other players is now only a 49% chance to win. So you want to raise with ace-ace in pocket aces um, in order to make sure that um, you are playing just one player to get those chips and increase your likelihood of winning. Um, so, I think most people, oh, so we've got one person who calls, we have somebody who folds, my hand is absolute rubbish. Um, so I fold, I'm a little surprised with this one, but this gets interesting. He actually calls, which is really quite strange. Um, and then he folds. So, as you can see, it's quite an interesting flop, an interesting board. The guy who did have pocket aces now has three of a kind. He has trips, or as we say, when you have um, the pair in your actual, as your cull cards, they're a set. So he has a set of aces, and its sets are very, very powerful, because it's not obvious that someone has such a strong hand. At the moment, it looks like the strongest hand could be a pair of aces and it's a very concealed, very strong hand. However, if you look at the other player, he's got 4-5. He hasn't quite got a hand yet, his hand really is just 5 high, but if he gets a 3, he will have a straight. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And a straight is the next best hand up from, um, from 3 of a kind. So in this case here, he's waiting on a 3. There are 4 of them in the deck, I know for a fact that 16% chance that he can get that hand. So he's only got a 16% chance he can win. So obviously he checks, hoping to get another card and hoping it'll be a three. Now I was surprised by this move. The guy who has um, quite a good hand only bets 60. Now, I was, I've been humming and hiring over this because what that gives what he's actually offering by only putting 60 in the pot, he's offering the other player around about, we say roughly, about 4 to 1 odds um, in order for him to carry on playing. When, as you know, I've just said, he has a 16% chance, so what's that? So a 7 to 1 potential chance of winning. But the one guy falls and he decides to play. I probably would do too. It's just such a small amount. 
Was there a question? Sorry, there's a you think you think he's bet low to try and entice the the guy with the pair of faces he's bet low to entice you the person. Yeah, he wants some more chips in, which in my opinion is the wrong thing to do, because you allow people who are waiting on a hand, who what we call who are drawing to a hand, who haven't quite made a hand, but one card will make their hand. You allow them to see another card really cheaply. Mm -hmm. And I don't like anyone having anything cheap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I most certainly I would have bet big because it also disguises the strength of my hand, because yeah. betting big is what a lot of people do to bluff. Yeah. Okay. Well, it varies. Some people do bet little to bluff as well. You have to watch. So when there's only two cards to be drawn, and there's four threes in the hand, how's that 15% chance? I can go through all the maths. I was planning to do that if I get to do a chance of a next session. You just but assume there was 52. Yeah, but you've got two chances of getting it. You've got yeah. two chances of getting and there's a bunch of cards that are on yeah. the table already when yeah. you're face down. Yeah, yeah. so you you're, not, but you're not betting on 52, you're basing it on the, the first one that there'll be 47 unseen cards. Yeah. I can go through this if you like. No, it's fine. We can go through it later. Yeah, I'd be interested. Yeah, it is, it is really worthwhile knowing. It's much but, higher than I would have thought. But what I know um, is a little um, shortcut that I was taught. So you work out how many outs there are. So for example, in this case, we know it's only threes that, and there's four of them in the pack. If you multiply by four, when you've got two more cards to come by, that gives you your odds then. And when there's just one more card, you multiply by two. So it's, that's how I always work it out quickly in my head. So, but it's, it depended on what you know will help you win. So for example, if you, th you, know, you could say that there are three more fives in the deck, that could add to him winning. But I think we kind of know that a five wouldn't help him win. So, yeah, so, so now we are down to um, to just being one card, and like I said, there is just a um, eight percent chance. So what's that? And it's at what, eleven to one. Someone can correct me on my maths. So there's about eleven to one chance of um, of hitting this three. So he checks again, hoping to get a free card, especially as the ace has bet so little. If someone did that to me, I would be expecting him to check. But he bets 120. So he's giving him, um, you know, almost um, 3 to 1 odds to play. He doesn't have the odds, technically, in this instance, to carry on playing. But he does. And look what happens. Way he gets the 3. <laughs> and as, as you might well say, he was a lucky fish very very lucky when he was not playing the odds so if he did that all day he'd probably be down you say he'd be down but look what happens next he checks no surprise this guy wants to get some more money he knows he's got the best hand he bets quite big oh look he puts all his chips in <laughs> but it's no limit you can put all your chips in whenever you like now this guy with aces thinks what must that three have given him? Maybe he suddenly hit his set of threes. Surely he couldn't have been playing with four or five. You can probably imagine. <laughs> you can probably imagine his annoyance. So going back to the yachts, the guy who bet 120 wasn't such a bad bet after all, because he bet 120 and won 7,000. Now I'll take those odds any day. And that's what we call implied odds. What are the maximum amount? If you do hit, what do you get? And I think yeah. it's one of the interesting concepts I'd like to go through next time of odds and implied odds and expected um, and effective odds. And there's all this kind of thing that goes on. I think the guy waiting on the three, if he'd played this guy before and knew if he hit the three he'd get all his chips, he did exactly the right thing. And if he did that all day, he would always be up. Does that make sense? Yeah, even if you sometimes lose, but in, in general, mm. if you win, Jenny, just, win. one win covers like mm. 100 losses in this case. But you've got to take the example, say this guy is playing again, had lost all, loads of chips beforehand and only had a thousand, he then might only win a thousand chips and then he wouldn't be playing the odds, he'd be losing. And I think but if the round case, before... The guy had two aces just played poorly, is it? No, I think he played well. But like in the how, how's, how's he to guess that someone, that, that someone he's not four. going for like maximum, like, uh, you know, 
Because you criticised him in that. Uh, yes, he didn't. He, I think his. Um, they do say in Berger, one mistake leads to another, and I yeah, think, so as you say, his his critical mistake was after the flop not betting big enough. He yeah. was getting greedy. He wanted to get more chips in. Mm -hmm. so, you, so you are right. He played badly on the flop. You could say there's an ace and a two and a three, so it's not a big leap of imagination to go. Well, who, but you buy well, a four and a five potentially. Yeah, but Absolutely, and this is what's great about poker. You've got to think about what he did in the first round. The guy who had aces raised. He called a raise. Very few people will call a raise with four five, and will keep on calling bets on just what you know. Mm -hmm. Four cards in the deck coming out. It's unlikely, mm -hmm. which is why it works so well for the guy who <laughs> managed to double up in chips. What happens if uh, fifty four v one? has a lot more chips and puts everything in, does it, and AA has not enough to cover that. What would happen is just take all of AA's chips. Oh, okay. If it was the other way round, um, and AA had far more, um, he would just match with what he, the other guy had, and he would get them all, and what was left over he'd be left with. So, you wouldn't, so AA wouldn't be allowed to put in more, so the 54 has to really buy him? No, oh. it's, a, it's, uh, it's the same in cash as well. Even in cash, if you say I only had two pounds of chips mm -hmm. and someone had a thousand and they went all in for a thousand, I put my two in. I still play for the two, right. but I can only get a possibility of doubling up. I can only get two from his stack. Oh, I couldn't possibly win his, but I'm only in for one in. Question? So it means that the guy with two aces at the start now is going home basically. Yeah, out of he's still got 270 left. Did, yeah, so that, uh, yeah. Okay. So, okay. yeah and, and probably sick as a dog and probably as we say, gone on tilt and not very happy, not with a clear head anymore. I don't think I'd be too happy if that happened to me. But that's poker and that is why we keep playing it again and again. That is essentially the annoyance but the love of poker. And at that point, they show their cards, do they? Yes. Okay, right. Check yeah. out so once they <laughs> <laughs> take that with your aces. Yeah. <laughs> if if you're probably in the casino, if we were with an ill-tempered gentleman, he would no doubt <laughs> toss his cards in and just storm off. <laughs> Leave the city. Oh, actually, no. He's still got chips. He'd sit there, be stewing. Of, what are you doing in the pot with four five? What are you doing in the pot with four five? As they always do. I would turn the table and choose his opponent. I'm still waiting to see that one. <laughs> so I've got one more example to show you from um, from this. So, um, oh, so this is much later on. Um, so the blinds have gone up, the blinds go upstairs, <coughs> so you've seen that there were 20 and 40. Then I think they went 30, 60. 40, 80, and now they're at 140, 280. Um, as you can see, I started with 7.5, I've now made it up to 12, 12,825, so I'm not doing too badly. So, um, again, it's all, even though the blinds have gone up, it's still the same options, they get to fold, call, call the 280, or raise up. So the first guy folds, he folds, folds, I fold. It was a rubbish hand. Um, this guy here raises twice the big blind to 560. Excuse me. Um, he calls. We have a fold. We have a fold. And we have a call. Um, and so because everyone's now matched, um, we get to move on to the interesting cards that have been played. Um, so again, the first person to speak is um, the next um, clockwise after the dealer. And so um, he checks. As you can see, solid AA currently doesn't have a hand. His hand is actually um, queen high, but he does have four of the same suit. And if another of the same suit appears um, on the board on the next two cards, he has a very, very strong hand. And as you can see, so he now um, checks. And the next guy along, they all have strange names. Um, Super <laughs> He again also has a it's hand that is. <laughs> what was that? So he's self deprecatingly arrogant with his name. <laughs> <laughs> you hear a lot of people calling themselves donkeys and fish and things like that along the way as well. 
Um, this guy who's got um, nine, ten, again would just need one um, card to give him a straight. So, um, but he wouldn't want, so he'd want a nine to give him a straight, but he wouldn't want the nine of clubs because that gives his opponent the flush and a flush beats a straight. So, he bets, he bets big. We get a caller over there. And we've got another caller. And look, the straight, the flush. Um, and also the straight. So as I just said, he wouldn't want to see the seven of clubs. So the guy with 9-10 must be very wary. He's quite excited he now has a good hand. The guy with um, the ace-10 of clubs is only really wary of someone with an ace-high. So if someone had, for instance, um, ace-5 of clubs, the ace-5 of clubs would win because the ace is what would determine the win. So um, in this case, the guy who has the flush side to check he pushes all his chips all in. Because everyone had checked, he must assume that he has the best hand. We have a caller, and the guy is flush, of course. And then the nine comes down, which is no help to anybody. And the first guy checks. He bets quite heavily, the other guy folds. And the guy who, then at this point, um, all the cards are shown. And the guy with the flush wins. Fairly straightforward. We got any questions on those? Dumb question. The flush is. Flush is five of the same suit. Right. It can, can be, be any order. order. They don't have to be. Because um, it's one of the things that confused me when I was told about the flush. I thought it would have to be, um, for instance, six, seven, eight, nine, all of the same suit. But it's five cards, all of um, all the same suit. Just like a straight can be any suit. They just have to be consecutive, and there has to be five of them. So Mr. Dude had a straight of uh, six, seven, eight, nine. Yes. Uh, so his hand ten, was... Ten, nine, eight, seven, six. Yeah. 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 <laughs> ten down to something. Yeah. So the nine made no difference. And the audience. Yeah. yeah. That, that is the basics of how you play poker. Thanks for really easy. It is really easy. <laughs> <laughs> the, hard, the hard part was the little things that I was throwing in in between. So, um, well, when's the lunchtime poker club then? It's always catered off. So, <laughs> so I've got um, a couple more slides to just run through of, um, of me boring and talking. You fall asleep now. Oh. How did it get to that time? <laughs> I said it was going to take about half an hour, didn't I? Um, so I'll just quickly run through these if it wants to start back up again. So, um, so just to go through um, what I'm actually um, considering before I play any of my cards, I'm not just looking at what my cards are. Obviously, the strength of my hand. The, the two whole cards determines whether I'm going to play on or not. But as I was talking about, and it's something that a lot of people don't get, whereabouts you sit, how close you are to the button, is the most important thing. And if I'm honest, it's something that I've only been able to incorporate into my games this year. As much as I've always known it's important, I now tend to play, like the professionals, two-thirds of my hands from those last three spots. Um, the other thing I'm considering, and it's not I'm considering all, it's I'm considering all of these things, every single hand that I play. I'm also considering how many chips I have. If I have a lot of chips, I might be able to gamble a bit more. Um, or I might be able to bully other people at later, rain, later rounds if I have many more chips than them. If I don't have very many chips, it might be a case of it doesn't matter what my cards are, I might just want to try and bluff by putting all the chips in the middle. Um, I'm obviously considering what my opponents have. If they have great big stacks and I don't have very many chips. And so I'm also basing it on how other people are betting. So if lots of people are, um, are constantly betting all the time, I might want to play a bit tighter, not necessarily play so many hands. If people aren't playing many hands, I might want to play more. I might want to raise more. I might want to bet more. Um, I'm also looking at what my table image is. Um, because obviously how people see me, if they see me raising all the time, they might think that I'm not playing with very good hands and decide to call more often. 
I'm also looking at when the blinds go up, so as you saw, they increased quite a lot before. Um, and looking at what's happened before, and um, I think I've pretty changed much, um, repeated myself there, but one of the other main things I'm looking at, has something massively changed? So has someone just suddenly doubling chips? Because that'll change how the table acts, and you've got to <coughs> react to that. So, why do we fold a hand? It is really straightforward, and a lot of beginners still don't do this. Why do we fold a hand? Before the flop, we quite frankly fold it because we don't think we can win. A lot of people still play their hand because they kind of think, oh, well, you know, I have to see what the flop brings. If you've got strong players who are constantly putting in chips, you could just be losing chips on bad hands. And after the flop, we can't bet for value, as in other words, we have a hand, so therefore we want to get more chips into the pot. We want our opponent to put those chips into the pot, or we can't bluff. And so if you, especially new people, new people who start to play poker tend to want to see the next card again and again. They tend to keep calling. It's very hard to bluff someone who's new to the game because they might not even see, for instance, that there's a potential flush on the board. And so it's hard. Um, and there are also certain people who just do keep calling all the time and you can't bluff them. Um, or you obviously can't bluff someone who's got the best hand. And also another reason to fold if someone hasn't given you the correct odds to call, as we spoke about briefly before. So we, why do we raise? Um, I want to just put on there because it's fun. It's, um, <laughs> it's my favourite part of the game because um, it's the best and easiest way to win chips. But before the flop, we, um, we want to build a big pot, so we raise to get more chips into the pot. Or like I was talking about before, we want to isolate a player. So we, want, we don't want to play against four people because it's harder to play against four people. We actually want to get down to just playing against one person, so we raise to try and isolate down to one person. And sometimes we raise, especially when we're on the button and everyone else is folded around to us, it's a very good position to raise just to steal the blinds. And quite often, especially in a tournament, when the blinds get higher and higher, to stay alive and keep yourself going, you have to keep stealing those blinds. And so after the flop, um, we'd raise because we want to find out where we stand. It's a good way. Chips are our, our ammunition and our ways of finding out what have people got. If they call, well, are they drawing something? Maybe they have something. Obviously, if they fold, they have nothing. But if they raise, they're suddenly telling you. So if they raise your raise, they're suddenly telling you that they have a much better hand than you do. Um, and I know I'm quickly running out of time. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we want to get more chips in, and we, we, we also want to give incorrect odds, as well as we want the other players sometimes to fold, just to bluff. Um, why do we call? This one's a hard one because it's not something I do very often. Um, before the flop, someone else is raised and we want to disguise our hands. So if, for example, we have something like pocket aces, and if we re-raise, they'd be likely to fold their hand. We might just call what they've, what they've raised with. Um, or we might just have correct odds. There might be so many people who've called, we might have a marginal hand that it might be worth calling, just to see what the, um, what the flop brings, because we've got so much to win. And after the flop, again, we might just call to uh, disguise the strength of our hands, or we have odds to call. Uh, and that's pretty much it. I've decided to put Gamble Aware up, because if anyone decides that they want to um, go and play poker online, I recommend just give that a read. It gives some great advice for how to um, decide how much to play, etc. And if I do get a chance, if I haven't waffled too much or bored you all to sleep, if I do get a chance, these are the kind of things I uh, would like to go through. I'd like to go into more detail in odds and how you work them out from scratch. Um, how and who to bluff, which is always useful. Set mining, which I touched on briefly before, but it's quite an interesting concept. Squeezing, jamming, talking about more types of players. Um, Phil Helmuth, who is a famous poker player, puts everyone into categories of animals. So talk some about that, and then ranges, polarised ranges, three betting, four betting, and my favourite, five betting. Thank you. <laughs> Book it in. Who wants to play? <laughs> <laughs>
I have a question about yeah. the tournament. So uh, when you play this type of tournament, when you have like 9,000 <coughs> players, how, how is it like assigned for the next uh, round of play? Is it like that uh, people with similar number of uh, uh, it's random. are... So it's, it's completely, completely random. random. So, so you what happens is, so when I played that 9,000 online, um, there were nine people per table. And so the computer just randomly puts all these people on different tables. When it gets down to maybe um, some people are just left with, say, eight on a table, <coughs> um, you can take people off the main table, and so slowly the table's getting broken down while they're trying to maximise to nine people on the tables. You'll occasionally get a point where there might be eight people or seven people on the table, but they're always trying to make sure all the tables are as full as possible by breaking the table. So it's just as full as possible mm -hmm. and the rest is randomly, so yeah. it doesn't matter how much you have or how much you want just randomly generates. And in the casino, for example, the way it's normally decided, um, if they're moving, so say tables on balance, so there's nine people on one table and seven on the other, they want to take one person off the nine, off, with the nine people on there, they'll say the person who's next to be big blind, because that's the fairest way, is going to move. Because they're going to be big blind next, they could be moving into the, the big blind spot on the new table. Do you have like... Uh divisions or leaks, like, you know, because in casino you have, like, different types of tables, like the tables where they play for more and for less. If you're playing cash tables, definitely, you will go, you know, especially in Vegas, there were tables for one dollar, two dollars, <coughs> and I'm pretty sure there were tables for a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars. That's just blinds, so if you think a raise could, could be six hundred dollars, just to raise, someone else could call that, someone else could re-raise. Really, can end up with silly moments in instances. So what's the minimum number of chips you need in a double blind or a single blind to just even be saying, "I'll oh, just minimum command I can take a part in a game." If you want to play cash game, so in a tournament game, you're given a set amount of chips. It's decided. But if you were to go to a cash game, um, I would. I normally play when I play cash games a hundred times the big blinds. So um, I play five cent, ten cent, and I put um, ten dollars on the table. Mm -hmm. Or if I play two cent, five cent, I <coughs> put five dollars on. How much did it cost to enter that tournament you showed us? Four to seven and a half thousand chips. It was thirty-three dollars, but I had played the day before on what's called satellite, and I do you collect points the more you play. Yeah. And I played for some of my points, and I probably took me about an hour or two, and I won that and that entered me into that game. So I very rarely would actually, I think never would buy in directly for $30. I buy in normally for about $5. And then when you left in the 480th place or whatever you were up? I won <coughs> 90 dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So you just decided it's time to go to bed and you... I needed leave. to work the next yeah. day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you just leave your chips and... and you no, I went all in. I actually played. I had an... It was a hand I might have folded otherwise. Yeah. I had top pair, but I ran into, um, I think he had three of a kind. But you, so you lost all your chips at that point. Yeah. But it it gave, credited me the money because I was in 446th place. They were paying to oh. a thousand and eight years. And that was because the however many thousands had already dropped out before then? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Be yeah, we got down to about a thousand coming about 11 o'clock. Right. How much do you think you've improved over the years based on the knowledge that you have now rather than purely the odds? Yeah, you know. um, so I'd say, so I've probably been playing for just over 10 years and I've played a lot of house games to start with and I'm quite good at house games and I was doing okay and I played online and I've always been okay um, and in the last year I've pretty much been reading everything I can get my hands on, listening to audio books and I've just improved so much. It's really noticeable. And it's not just that, it's when I sit down at a table, it's just so clear what people are doing sometimes. Sometimes I can see what people's cards are without them even showing me. And it's quite interesting when I folded a hand and they show me, like, that's why I folded my hand, I knew you had that. <laughs> And I can teach you all the same if you want to listen. <laughs> <laughs>